I'm pleased and, and very honored uh, tonight to welcome our speakers. We have Dr. Alexa Koenig and Professor Eric Stover who are doing the difficult work that is critical to the counterbalancing the terrible cost of conflict around the world. They are the co-directors of the UC Berkeley award-winning Human Rights Center. They are the frontliners and in the struggle to hold leaders accountable for crimes against humanity. Uh, such crimes are often uh, a byproduct of war. So, you know, the question is, how do these investigators track down the worst offenders? And tonight, Dr. Koenig and Professor Stover will share some of their stories on how high-tech tools are being used to hunt down today's most notorious criminals. I'll share a, a little bit about each of their backgrounds, and I encourage you to explore their writings. And if you have a chance, um, I would check out their three-part documentary. It's called Dead Reckoning, and it was recently aired on PBS. So now a little bit about Dr. Alexa Koenig. Alexa, she's right here. Um, she is the executive director of, of UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, and she is a lecturer in residence at UC Berkeley uh, School of Law. She teaches classes on human rights and international criminal law. Her many publications include the book Hiring in Plain Sight, The Pursuit of War Criminals, From Nuremberg to the War on Terror, which she co-wrote with Professor Eric Stover and Victor Peskin. She is currently a member of the Technology Advisory Board of the Office of the Prosecutor of International Criminal Court. And she's often called upon to speak about the role of emerging technologies in human rights practices. Uh, Dr. Koenig has won numerous honors and awards in her research, including grants from the National Science Foundation and a fellowship with the American Association of University Women. And I had the pleasure before we um, came into this room to spend some time with her, and, and she's incredibly impressive. Um, Professor Eric Stover is a faculty director of the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center, and he's an adjunct professor for UC Berkeley School of Law. He is a pioneer in utilizing empirical research methods to address emerging issues in human rights and international humanitarian law. He has served on several forensic missions to investigate mass graves as an expert on mission to the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. His research helped launch the international campaign to ban landmines and that uh, actually received the Nobel Prize in 1997. He has published six books, including The Witnesses, War Crimes, and The Promises of Justice in the Hague and The Breaking of Bodies and Minds, Torture, Psychiatric Abuse, and the Health Professions. Um, please join me tonight in welcoming, welcoming both Dr. Koenig and Professor Silver. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And, um, a special thanks to, 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 to Carolyn, who we've been working with to, to organize this, this talking tour. We went to San Diego and Los Angeles. And uh, just now, uh, Alexa and I drove up from campus. I should say we crawled up from campus when we hit 24. I'm sure you did as well. Um, but the, to let you know, everything's fine on campus. It's not a battlefield. Uh, the Campanile's still standing. <laughs> And uh, Sprawl Hall is not up in flames, and uh, the Roma is serving lots of good coffee and, uh, and lattes. Uh, actually, we, we were, Alex and I were walking from the law school down to, to where we were parked, and, and first of all, I noticed there was a lot of good parking on campus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also the fact that, it, that there are a lot of students out and moving around, and uh, as far as we know, there were no incidents taking place, although there were a lot of helicopters in the, in the sky. But, um, so tonight, uh, what we're going to do is I, I'm going to begin, and I'm going to begin with a personal story, uh, which really is the trajectory to leading to the establishment of the Human Rights Center, uh, which was established in 1994. I came to, to Berkeley uh, 22 years ago uh, to take over the, what was a program, and I turned it into a center. So my story, um, and, and, and forgive me for this, but it really does connect to the forensic work and to the high-tech work that we do. And it all started actually back uh, in March of 1976. I was traveling in Argentina, 
And it was the day the military took power. Uh, they took power for seven years. And on that day, I happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I spoke Spanish, and they, who was this foreigner who spoke Spanish? And I was detained. And I was taken into a, a, a jail and put into jail uh, with a, a number of uh, young men, Argentine and Bolivian young men who were there. I was fortunate. I had a passport. Uh, and the next day, I only spent one night, I was taken and put on a train and expelled to Bolivia. Uh, but that night set the course of my life, and that was because so many of the young men that I was detained with, I was only 22 at the time, and they were probably 18 to 25 or 6, had really been badly tortured or beaten up. And we spent the night together kind of talking each other down. We were very frightened. And there was a lot of, uh, uh, we had actually ripped shirts and tied up wounds and so on. As I say, I was not, uh, and I think it was because I was an American and I had a passport. But of course, for me, I could leave. But I'm sure many of them disappeared. So then I eventually go on and do work in Brazil and in France, and I end up in London working for Amnesty International in the late 70s. And then I come back to the United States and I joined the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is based in Washington, DC. Uh, many of you who are scientists may know it published, of course, Science Magazine. So I started, an organ I started a program there called on science and human rights. And largely what we were doing at the program was to try to intervene when Soviet scientists were detained, Soviet dissidents, or when scientists and doctors and nurses disappeared around the world. It was fortunate I could go to get Nobel laureates and we'd make trips to Chile or different places and try and plead with the authorities to release these scientists. But this real journey began one day uh, when I received a visit from three of the Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, or in Argentina, you say Mayo instead of Mayo in Spanish. Well, the abuelas are the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, and they came to see me in 1983. A new civilian government had come to power, and they asked me, uh, and I call it la pregunta, the question, the big question was, um, we have lots of grandchildren who are either born in detention and our children were killed, and they, these girls, these children were given up for illegal adoption, to uh, childless military police families. And uh, we would like to know, uh, you know, two or three of us are alive, grandparents, and our children are gone, but we have this grandchild. Is it possible to do genetic analysis and link us if we found that grandchild? And some of these, the abuelas were actually finding out where some of these children were adopted and working as maids to do detective work, and they were really quite, uh, quite amazing. And I looked at them and I said, uh, I don't really know, but I'll look into it. Then about two weeks later, our, the our new Argentine civilian government had set up a, a commission to investigate the thousands of people who had disappeared during military rule. And they sent me a letter asking if I would bring a, a team of forensic scientists down to Argentina to begin the exhumations of the, of the mass graves. Again, I, look, I didn't know anything at all about that sort of work. What I did is I actually ended up at Cal. I ended up with Mary Claire King, if anyone knows, recall of Mary Claire King. Uh, Mary Claire uh, did really leading research on breast cancer and the genetic determinants of breast cancer. Um, and uh, I talked to her and she hummed and hawed and she said she'd come with me on the team, so she came. And then I got a group of forensic scientists from around the world, the, the United States, and we went down to Argentina. We traveled around the country, and then we declared that we asked the government to stop all exhumations uh, of these mass graves until we could train a team. We tried to get Argentine forensic scientists engaged. They were not interested. It was a little dangerous. Some of them had been complicit by turning a blind eye to, to what had happened. So in, at any rate, we found students from the university. And this is the second point I want to make. And that is how key in this journey was finding students who were brave enough to come, get trained, and we worked with them. That team has celebrated its 33rd anniversary. And it's worked in 24 countries around the world. We later went to 
to Chile, to Peru, trained a team. And in Guatemala, we found students and trained a team. And I'll stop there, and we'll see a, a portion of the video, um, which will tell you a little bit about the work uh, we did in Guatemala. And then Alexa will come up and tell you how we're engaging students in the high-tech area. Thanks. Impunity has been the norm rather than accountability. Unless governments will face up to the crimes that they've committed or are willing to investigate the crimes of other countries or other governments, then we'll never get ourselves extricated from the past. Increasingly, impunity is under attack from human rights investigators determined to hold war criminals accountable for the most distant crimes. The Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Foundation was founded in 1991 to identify victims of a 30-year civil war between the government and leftist guerrillas many of them from the indigenous Mayan population. Both sides engaged in human rights violations during the war. But the Guatemalan military and national police committed crimes on a vast scale, according to Eric Stover, who investigated human rights violations throughout Latin America. During at least a 30-year period, there was armed insurgency, but the government used it as an excuse to repress its indigenous communities. And there was a turning of a blind eye. There was active engagement in human rights violations of war crime throughout the country. During the Cold War, countless civilians were murdered throughout Latin America by military regimes intent on destroying political opposition. Only in Guatemala did the slaughter reach the point of genocide. If you look at the reports that the military put out in that era about those Mayan communities, it's very clear that they believe that the Maya across the board, men, women, and children, were 100% supportive of the guerrilla overthrow of the Guatemalan government. And that automatically made them enemies and therefore targets for army operations. Kate Doyle assesses evidence of human rights crimes at the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C. Documents that she obtained in Guatemala have exposed the military's campaign of violence. These assembled units would sweep through a series of villages. They would gather the population. They would separate it by sex. They would torture them for information. They would typically carry out uh, rapes and other sexual assaults. And ultimately, uh, they would either gun down or burn alive that village. A real homicide investigation, you start at the crime scene, of course. But what you have to do is take your evidence and build it into a story, the story that the evidence tells you the story the bones tell you. They are the witnesses. They are the best witnesses. The late Dr. Clyde Snow was a pioneer in the field of forensic anthropology. Beginning in the mid-1980s, he and Eric Stover located mass graves in Argentina, Chile, and other countries plagued by human rights violence. He made his first trip to Guatemala in 1991 at the request of ethnic Mayan families who had lost loved ones in the Civil War. He made his last trip there in 2013 for this film, shortly before his death. Between those endpoints, he exhumed mass grave sites throughout the country. Well, I'm asked the question pretty frequently, how long have you been a human rights advocate? And I have to explain, I'm not an advocate. I'm an expert. We find the evidence 
Then we turn it over to the advocates who fight this battle in courts. It's hard, you know, for a revisionist to argue with a skull with a gunshot wound in the head. Late 20s, I would... When I would established guess, scientists in Guatemala refused to take part in exhumations, point. Snow enlisted students. Freddy Pacharelli was Snow's first assistant Maybe, yeah. in Guatemala. They began Maybe. searching for massacre sites while the conflict was still going on. Yeah. I came here in January of 95, and my first case was Cuarto Pueblo, the massacre of 424 men, women, and children. And we found 42 100-pound sacks of bone fragments. Pecciarelli is now director of the foundation. He and Dr. Snow classified victims into two categories. First, the ethnic Maya. Second, the urban activists, including students and labor leaders whom the military regime had designated enemies of the state. Some 45,000 of these enemies had disappeared without a trace. By 2010, the foundation had been unable to find one. So Clyde and I were in his hotel room at the Holiday Inn one night, late, bottle of uh, single malt scotch, and Clyde begins to insist, you know, how come we haven't found the disappeared? How come we're not digging? How come we're not looking? Where are the cemeteries they're using to bury the unidentified? In search of an answer, Snow and Pecciarelli came here to La Verbena Cemetery in Guatemala City. It has served as the final resting place for generations of the urban poor. So we came over to the cemetery and we said, listen, we we're interested in looking at the records of all of the unidentified bodies. And they said, sure, they're right there. Um, anything for you, doctor. The cemetery office only had the records from 1981 to 1986. January to July of 81. So Clyde reached for one year, I reached for the other. We had started looking at the books. And in a couple of minutes, you know, Clyde turns to me and says, I think we just solved a thousand murders. Yeah, you see all these young 20-year-olds with gunshot wounds. This is their age. So, the cemetery records indicated a surge in nameless dead arriving in the middle of the night. You know, you could see 10 bodies found in one location in one day. You just went on and there was more and more, and all of these bodies grouped together. The ages between 18 and 35, men, shots to the head. I mean, this whole thing was, how do you explain all this? The only way to explain it was the conflict. These were the victims of the enforced experience. The records of anonymous corpses led investigators to nearby pits where generations of the poor had been discarded. The next task was exhumation, which required investigators to rappel through 75 feet of darkness to reach the corpses at base. What the perpetrators wanted to do was remove certain people out of the communities because they may be organizing in ways that they're not happy with. And so I don't care if it's in Zimbabwe or it's in the former Yugoslavia, if it's in Bosnia or Rwanda or Argentina or Guatemala, the, the modus operandi is basically the same. And that is to capture people, take them and execute them away from any witnesses, and then to bury them anonymously and hope that no one ever finds them. The remains were not only anonymous, they were also intermingled and decayed. The foundation urged relatives of the disappeared to provide DNA samples which would speed identification. The discovery of remains at La Verbena led human rights investigators to expand their search for the missing. The next step was extremely logical. We targeted military installations because the military had lists of these internal enemies of the state. So we thought there's a lot of bodies in these places. Their hunch proved correct. Investigators have discovered hundreds of bodies at military and national police bases. 
Although the military installations represent 2% of our investigations, we've recovered 21% of the bodies in these military installations. In addition to bodies, investigators have also discovered secret government archives containing records of police and military operations. Among the most significant finds was a military diary nicknamed the Death Squad Dossier. The military diary is a document that was smuggled out of a military archive and is given to Kate Doyle of the National Security Archives in the States. It shows how the military documented internal enemies of the state. And among that is 183 people documented with pictures and descriptions, uh, nicknames, organizations they belong to, salaries, locations where they were captured, and sometimes the date when they were executed. The process of determining historical truth formally began in the mid-1990s, when the Civil War ended. Memorials were erected to the victims, and as a condition of the peace accord, Guatemala established a historical clarification commission to detail the fate of the disappeared and massacre victims. The commission's final report, entitled The Memory of Silence, was presented in 1999. The commission was willing to articulate the intentionality on the part of the government, that these were deliberate operations that were intended to kill civilians. Declaraciones de antiguos miembros de los servicios de seguridad del Estado y documentación desclasificada que demuestra que los servicios de inteligencia del ejército, especialmente la G2 y el Estado Mayor Presidencial, fueron los autores intelectuales y los organizadores directos de capturas, interrogatorios ilegales, torturas, desapariciones forzadas, ejecuciones. The commission called out the army over and over again for the atrocities it committed. You couldn't say this in any more kind of powerful, succinct way. The Truth Commission determined that state-sponsored terror peaked in the early 1980s during the reign of a general named Jose Efraim Rios Montt. Under his command, the army embarked on campaigns of genocide and annihilation in indigenous villages. Fully 80% of the crimes were committed during Montt's dictatorship. Después del informe de la Comisión para el Esclarecimiento Histórico, había un reclamo que frente a las Cortes Nacionales para que los casos avanzaran. Claudia Paz y Paz was appointed Attorney General of Guatemala in 2010, part of a new wave of reformers in a country long ruled by the military. Shortly after her appointment, she began exploring indictments for perpetrators of crime cited in the Truth Commission report. With indigenous people, and international human rights groups expanding their protests against impunity, Paz y Paz charged former President Rios Montt with genocide and crimes against humanity. In this case, we are talking about judging the most high responsible. Rios Montt assumes for a blow of the state. And that was also part of the evidence to demonstrate his responsibility in giving the orders, in supervising the orders, y en velar por qué se ejecutaran estos planes militares que condujeron al genocidio, pero que también están documentados por sus propios, sus propios documentos. The most incriminating evidence was this logbook for one Operation Sofia, which an anonymous source leaked to Kate Doyle. The acts of genocide against Mayan communities detailed in these pages were executed by senior officers. What's amazing about the Operación Sofía records is that you get the orders, you get the plan, you get the commander's orders, and then you get the reports from the field, from those patrol units that go back to the commanders and then back up to the top. At the top of the Operation Sofía command structure, Guatemalan's then leader, General Efraim Rios Montt. In 2013, 
He was tried in Guatemala State Court for the genocide of 1,700 Mayan Ishils. Nunca autoricé. Nunca firmé. Nunca propuse. Nunca ordené que se atentara contra una raza, una etnia o una religión. They had almost a hundred witnesses, people who had seen the massacres, people whose family members died, people who were personally raped. They came for this and they spoke honestly, openly, in their own language, in the Ishil. And Rios Montt had to listen with headphones to their stories. On May 10th, 2013, Rios Montt was convicted on all charges of genocide and crimes against humanity. Por las razones expuestas, los juzgadores consideramos que la conducta del acusado José Efraín Ríos Montt encuadra en el delito de genocidio, por lo que debe imponerse la pena correspondiente. De la pena imponer, el artículo 376 del Código Penal establece el delito de genocidio, contemplando la pena de 30 a 50 años de prisión. Dentro de ese parámetro, los juzgadores hemos optado por imponer la pena de 50 años de prisión inconmutables. But 10 days later, Mont appeared in the Constitutional Court to hear that his conviction had been annulled. Other reversals quickly followed. Claudia Paz y Paz was removed from office along with her prosecutors and judges who had convicted Rios Montt. Cuando se están cometiendo violaciones masivas a los derechos humanos, el perpetrador tiene mucho poder y las víctimas no tienen tanto poder. La justicia tiene el efecto de igualar. Estaban sentados en el mismo nivel los perpetradores y las víctimas. Y desde ese lugar, desde que te veo yo a los ojos, decirle esto fue lo que ocurrió y lo que usted hizo estuvo muy mal. Fueron crímenes. Y que un tribunal lo recogiera y dijera también esto está mal, esto no puede ocurrir, tiene un valor simbólico muy importante. Rio Smont will face a new trial in 2017, but his health is failing. The Constitutional Court declared that in the event of a guilty verdict, he will not be in prison. The legal reversal has not deterred human rights investigators. Human remains continue to arrive at the foundation, and international activists continue to amass evidence of the crimes. This work it has nothing to do with the dead. It has everything to do with the living. And the damage that that missing person causes to the people that were able to survive these horrible ordeals. I think Guatemala has taught us that the road to accountability, justice, truth, maybe even reconciliation, is a very long and treacherous road. And there are people in those societies that are willing to travel it for their entire lives. So, just to continue here, from Guatemala, um, our work went to Srebrenica and Bosnia, to Iraqi Kurdistan during the Iraq War. And what became important when I came to Cal uh, 22 years ago was engaging students. And this has been the, we consider at the Human Rights Center, our students and our teaching and our human rights fellowship program, where we've had over 300 students now from six to seven UC campuses, including Berkeley, work with local human rights groups uh, during the summer. And what's important, and I want to emphasize here, what we found working with the students is they get to work alongside people like Freddie Pecciarelli, who you saw, 
or Claudia Passi Pass. And they get to learn from really courageous individuals and they, they get to learn what I think really is in, important in this work. They get to work with families of the disappeared and know that in some way they're helping them. So this is really the thrust at the center, is we like to take students. Uh, we're careful where we place them, of course. Uh, but we want to get, have students get out of the bubble of Berkeley and be, you know, fake, get a little bit out of your comfort zone. And you will learn so much. And you'll learn the values of working for other people and, and, the, and helping with their causes. So I'll, I'll end with that and have Alexa come up and she can tell us a little more about the programs we have and particularly the human rights uh, investigation lab which is manned by now some 70 students and what it's doing. Thank you. I'm feeling very short back here so I'll try and pace a little bit. Um, what I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about tonight is, as Eric mentioned, our Human Rights Investigations Lab and how what we're piloting on the UC Berkeley campus and have established as a startup is a win-win-win. It's a win for the human rights space. It's a win for the tech companies with which we're partnering. And most importantly, it's a win for our students. But before I get into that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I ended up at Berkeley, because it was as a student, and it was as one of Eric's students. So I've since had the great fortune to be on both sides of the Human Rights Center, learning from Eric and from the team that's there, and then later having the fortune to be the executive director. So I had actually started my background in human rights working on Native American um, tribal reservations throughout the state of California, working with about 70 of the tribal governments here in our backyard. In 2000, I entered law school at a university that shall be nameless on the other side of the bay. <laughs> and in 2003, graduated and joined the faculty at that particular institution. However, as a lawyer, I realized that there was a limitation to what I could contribute to the space and to the issues that I cared most deeply about. I saw that the tremendous and amazing laws that we have in our Constitution, both state and federal, have limitations about what they can actually provide and that there's often a gap between the laws on the book and the way those laws play out in practice. And so I decided after five years of being on the faculty that I really wanted to go get a PhD. And that's when I did two things that maybe weren't the smartest, but I'm really glad I did them. Um, the first is I decided there was only one university in the world that I wanted to go to for my PhD, and that was UC Berkeley. So I applied to their program in jurisprudence and social policy and crossed my fingers because I knew the odds were not in my favor and was very fortunate to find that I got in. The other maybe not so smart thing was I accepted that position to do the PhD, but I had a two and a half year old son at the time and my due date was for my daughter was the orientation day for entering the PhD program. So I had a crazy first year where in the mornings I would drive out to Berkeley and I live about an hour's commute away and I would do my morning classes and then at lunch I would drive home another hour and go nurse my daughter and then I would come back after lunch and I would take afternoon classes and then I was still on the faculty teaching night classes at the other university so I would drive down there and go um, teach classes at night and I would get home at about 11 p.m. at which point I would have dinner and start my homework and then the day would start all over again. So there was at one point, my husband turned to me the spring of that first year and he said, Alexa, you know, you're doing all this really interesting stuff, but at some point you've got to actually meet people on the Berkeley campus because I spent more time in my car than I did talking to human beings. And so I decided to go to a dinner that was being hosted. And I'm so glad that I did because I walked in and two other graduate students ran up to me and they said, Alexa, we're having to turn down a graduate student researcher position for the Human Rights Center. We know you have this interest in human rights. Would you like our spot? And I said, yes, that sounds fantastic. So I sat down with Laurel Fletcher, who runs the Human Rights Law Clinic. She had just started a major project in partnership with Eric. I had dinner with her, I submitted my resume at one o'clock in the morning, and the next morning I found out they'd hired me to work with them. And I have to say that the meaning and the experience of getting to work with people who knew how to have one foot firmly grounded in academia, but could bridge that world to the world of practice, made all the difference in my ability to get through six very challenging, but ultimately very meaningful and very exciting years. 
So today, we're very fortunate to have the Human Rights Center still going strong. And everything that we do is really focused around three things. And there are three things that I think you saw in this video and that Eric have spoke, has spoken about. First, everything we do is designed to amplify the voices of survivors, to make sure that the stories they have to tell are heard by people in positions of power to do something to help address their needs. Second, everything we do is designed to improve research and investigations. How can we harness emerging forms of science and emerging technologies to make an impact in, the, in what we're trying to accomplish? And the third is how do we empower the next generation of human rights advocates so they can go on and do the work that they care about and do it well? In 2015, we were very fortunate to win the MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions for the work that Eric has pioneered on the UC Berkeley campus. And that was a moment for us to pause and say, we've had these 20 incredible years. How do we now take a moment to figure out what we can contribute to the human rights space that nobody else can? We've never wanted to duplicate what everyone else is doing. If there's someone better positioned to do the work that we're thinking about, we'd rather help them do it. And what we realized is our greatest strength is the fact that we're affiliated with a campus of tens of thousands of some of the most bright and dedicated and educated faculty and students, tremendously diverse. And we were thinking about how we could tap into that. So I want to back up just a little bit to 2010-2011. One of the projects that we had been working on was looking at the International Criminal Court which was a new court that had recently come into being to try the highest level war crimes perpetrators and human rights abusers for the most grave crimes. But we noticed there was a problem. And that problem was that their cases were falling apart at relatively early stages of litigation, even though the whole world knew that these very grave abuses had occurred. So we asked the question, why was that? Or why is that? And we sent a PhD student to the court to look through the records. And she came back. And what she concluded was the court was over relying on witness testimony. And while the stories of survivors will always be the heart of any prosecution, those survivors' testimonies are ultimately quite vulnerable. Witnesses can be terrified into recanting their testimonies or not showing up to testify at all. Memories, particularly when compounded by trauma, are fragile. And oftentimes, those who were brave enough to come the thousands of miles to speak in court needed something to bolster their stories. So we began to figure out who's using innovative and creative ways to capture what's happening in conflict zones around the world. And we began to bring geneticists together with people who are pioneering new forms of satellite imagery, with people who are beginning to figure out how this sudden proliferation of smartphones around the world, how activists could use those to capture videos and photographs of what was happening. But what we were hearing from the court as this information started pouring in was that sometimes what people were capturing on their phones wasn't actually what the court needed. A lot of people thought it was the bomb or it was the dead body that the court would need. But most cases, the court knew what had happened in that particular atrocity. What they didn't know was how to tie that to the highest level perpetrator, the president of that country, or the commanding general, and connect what that person had commanded to the trigger pullers on the ground. So one of the things you need to do that is to draw the social network around those people and show the links between them. What better way to potentially do that than to begin to show the relationships and to use social media where more and more relationships were being able to be sketched out to begin to establish what was most needed. As part of that, we were also asked at the time to begin to administer a new technology advisory board for the International Criminal Court. And through that mechanism, we began to get to know some of the most innovative technologists around the globe. Some of those individuals just happened to be investigative journalists. There was a scrappy team of investigative journalists in Ireland and in the UK more generally who'd begun to figure out that by combing Twitter, by combing Facebook, and monitoring these different platforms, they could often scoop the major media news outlets on what was breaking and what was happening. And they could actually then verify the videos and the photographs that were coming out from survivors around the planet um, to send that to the major news media outlets to get those stories out. What was increasingly needed, though, was not just that discovery process of finding those bits of the story, 
but making sure that, say, if a video purported to be from Syria in 2016, that it actually was Syria 2016 and not Egypt in 2011 or from Syria many years previously. So they began to pioneer how to do verification and authentication work. Everything from geolocating that photo, corroborating it with satellite imagery, doing research on the person who'd posted it, and building these reports so that ultimately the world could have faith that what they were saying happened actually did occur. However, those journalists also had a problem. And the problem that they had was it can be very expensive to hire staff that have the cultural knowledge for all the areas where wars are erupting today. And how do you hire a staff that has the language flexibility to also be able to read all these tweets and Facebook posts in all of these different languages? That was really expensive to do. Well, a colleague of ours who we had hired to run our new technology and human rights program thought, well, why don't we train some students to do some of that work? He eventually went on to work at a tech company. So Andrea Lampros in our office and I decided, you know what, we're going to pilot this. This is a great idea. And we decided we're going to start seeing if we can create what's called a human rights investigations lab with about five students, train the, them in these journalistic techniques, figure out how we can use social media to find evidence of war crimes, um, and actually pull this together. Well, when the students found out about this program, there was such an overwhelming desire to take part that we eventually had to shut the floodgates at 42 that first semester. This semester, we have 60 students in the program. We've trained a total of 75. Those 60 students are about evenly divided between graduate students and undergrads, and they represent 25 different majors. So we have students coming together from very different disciplines and sharing their collective methods and knowledge and working collaboratively on projects. They speak among them 18 different languages. So we have this incredible flexibility to create rapid teams as, as we learn about crises in different parts of the world to assign them to do this work. We have a number of different clients who have come on board and asked us to provide the capacity that they can't afford to provide themselves. Our biggest partner has been Amnesty International. And with them, we've been supporting their effort to start what they're calling their Digital Verification Corps, which is an effort to have a team of trained university-based students um, on, we, right now, it's three different continents. There's a team in South Africa, a team in the United Kingdom, and we're the US branch of that effort. But not only are we trying to teach students how to do this discovery work, this verification and authentication work, but we're also trying to figure out how to pioneer the use of these mostly journalistic methods for legal accountability. And that's something that's never been done before. So we just started the first ever law school-based program on open source investigations in the law school this spring. And we're also working with two human rights organizations doing the open source investigation to complement the work that they're doing interviewing witnesses and survivors. And we're beginning to figure out how this can be rolled out at law firms and at courts around the globe. A big piece of this has been what it's meant, not only for the field who gets this increased capacity, not only for the tech companies, we have a number of companies that are pioneering new software platforms that can be used to help aid this kind of work, and they're in beta on many of those, those tools, and we are giving them real-time feedback, but mostly for the students. And what they've said is that they've been hungry to do something meaningful. It provides them an experiential education. It gives them units towards graduation, so they're actually working towards what they're, you know, getting their degree. They're being trained in cutting edge, high demand skills that are only gonna explode exponentially in terms of the demand, whether from journalists or from legal actors or from others working in the human rights field. And it's low cost and high efficiency. One of the best things has been breaking down the silos on campus. So I think one issue with being in a law school is when you're a lawyer, of course, everything looks like a legal problem. When you're a technologist, everything looks like a tech problem. But when you get a technologist working with a lawyer, working with a sociologist, and you get them sharing information, you suddenly get new insights that are incredibly exciting. One of the things I was seeing working at the intersection of technology and human rights is you had all these technologists who wanted to use their tremendous talents for good, and they were trying to figure out how to create new tools for the human rights space. You had human rights practitioners who knew they should be engaging in new technologies, but weren't even sure where to start. 
digital, they weren't proficient necessarily in digital security, and yet they were dealing with some of the most sensitive cases in the world and potentially putting themselves at risk. For the technologist, just as one concrete example, I saw there was one company that we were working with and they created a new app. And the idea for this app was that it could be downloaded to a smartphone and it was to document sexual violence that was occurring in conflict areas. But what they hadn't thought about was the country where they were planning to roll this out. In that country, the men only had access to cell phones. So at best, this app was going to have no worth. At worst, it was actually potentially going to get people hurt or killed. Because if a woman got her husband or her father or her brother's smartphone and downloaded this app and potentially indicated that she had experienced sexual violence, the ramifications of this could be dire. And so we were seeing a real need for bringing together these very different perspectives in the space to make the tools and the products and the processes better. One of our students has said, um, recently we were asking for feedback, and she wrote us and said, working on this project has been a dream. I hate to sound melodramatic, but this lab has honestly been surreal. It simultaneously feels very new and innovative and important and oftentimes frustrating. And I think that's amazing. As a teacher, to have your student tell you that she's frustrated, but she loves it, you know you're onto something important because they're creating this from the ground up. They've embraced from day one that this is their startup. One of my favorite days in working in the lab early on during this pilot year has been coming back from class and walking into my office and seeing that 12 students had taken it over and they had every whiteboard up against the wall and they had been scribbling all over them. And they go, Alexa, Alexa, we figured it out. And they had just designed a brand new workflow for the team and someone else had just created brand new verification forms and they had created an entire new system. And it was something that didn't come from faculty, but came from them grappling with these problems and figuring out how to make this process work. It's also provided a sense of power. So another student recently wrote to us, I think we're going to look back in 20 years, and we're going to have huge regret about Syria. And I think it's going to feel really good to say that I did something. So the chance when you're seeing these crises break out around you and you feel powerless to do anything but suddenly you're partnering with a group like the Syrian Archive, and you're taking the footage that people have risked their lives to capture. And you're helping to give that weight and to give it value and to give it credibility by building these reports around it, and then sending it back to our partners at Amnesty or at the law firm, and it's being sent on to the UN. You know you're part of a process of trying to get something, some accountability for what you're seeing, whether it's now or it's 10 years from now. So what's next? We're hoping to take this pilot year, take the lessons learned. We're going to host an international workshop in June where we bring together the students working in Pretoria with the students working in the UK and have them on the UC Berkeley campus to work with our Berkeley students. And we're going to debrief what worked, what didn't, and how we're going to set up this lab permanently for next year. <coughs> Right now, we're trying to find a space on the UC Berkeley campus to do it. We were finally able, I think about three months into the program, to wrangle a single faculty office that had been divided into four staff cubicles. And we've got 60 students working in that space. So we're trying to see if we can find something that will allow them to be even more efficient and effective in the way that they're pulling this together. The entire world is looking to us. Universities from across the globe have been hearing about this lab and want to know how they can get involved. So part of what we'll be doing in June is to try and draw up a blueprint and see if we can't actually replicate and roll out this kind of program for this work that's so desperately needed on campuses around the world. Um, ultimately, the lesson that I've been learning from the human rights space is one of the things that's most important to people, whether as survivors or as students working on these projects, is to hold on to some form of hope. The most exciting thing for me is the way that this project has potentially given our students hope and how they are determined not to give up in what they're ultimately taking on. Thank you. So what we're going to now do is have a Q&A and open it up to the audience um, to ask um, both of them questions about the program and their research and what they're doing on campus. Um, and I think we have people who have uh, mics. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then the staff will bring a mic to you. Hi, 
Hello, can you hear me? Great. Alexa, I have a question uh, for you regarding social media. Um, I was curious, given the impact of social media in your work, are you, is your group working directly with companies such as Facebook, uh, Twitter, et cetera? Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Great. Um, no, we're not currently, yes and no, I should say. So one of the things that we helped to pull together is I was trying in 2014 with Eric and our other colleagues to bring together all the major social media companies and tech companies right here in the Bay Area, figuring that we could help be a bridge with the International Criminal Court. One of the problems the International Criminal Court has had is that there's a law called the American Service Members Protection Act that actually bans any government entity in the United States from cooperating on an international criminal court investigation. And it's actually um, it's called, known as the Invade the Hague Act because there's actually a provision in that, that act that says if an American citizen is ever taken to the International Criminal Court for prosecution, the US reserves the right to militarily invade the Hague and extract that person by force. This was passed right after 9-11. Um, however, <laughs> so this has been a bit of a barrier to cooperation. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do is we tried in 2014 to bring the tech companies together with the ICC to talk about their mutual interest in preventing human rights abuses and potentially not having war criminals using their technologies as a platform for what they were trying to accomplish. Um, however, what we learned from the tech companies that was really interesting is they said most of what you're actually trying to get to help these war crimes related efforts, you don't need to actually come to us directly. You can use our advanced search functions and you know, maybe we can even show you how to use those to get the vast majority of information that would be helpful. So that's when it became really helpful to work with these investigative journalists and why we do open source investigations because by just tapping into what's publicly available on the internet, whether going through Google to get into Facebook or Google to get into Twitter, for example, is extremely efficient. What I would love to do, though, is talk to them even further and see if there's ways that we can align our work um, for even greater efficacy. Thanks. Um, hi, tech means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So for me, it means uh, new tools for recovering minute amounts of DNA from very degraded tissue uh, such that you can get meaningful polymorphisms or, or, or actual DNA sequence. Um, or, for example, chemical detection methods to know are there trace amounts of sarin or some other gas in what was sprayed on those poor people in Syria. So, so what, how do you partner with chemists and uh, Geneticists and, and uh, there are sequencing companies here in the Bay Area, uh, 434 and Illumina and all the rest of that. So, well, just just uh, perhaps I'll take that. Yeah. Just to start, uh, we're, we're actually now working uh, with a couple of geneticists, um, Henry Ehrlich and Tom White, well-known geneticist in the Bay Area, on a book called Genetics for Justice, and we're going to look at the whole way in which DNA analysis has been applied both in criminal and humanitarian actions. But one of the things we began back in 1990, uh, it was 1996 when I first came, was uh, in, in El Salvador, a number of uh, children during the Civil War, uh, their parents were killed and the children were given up for illegal adoption. Many of them came here to the United States, uh, and, and many went to uh, Europe. So we were asked if we would work and create a DNA data bank uh, in El Salvador, where we would find the biological families, take either backle swabs or blood samples, and create this data bank. And then here at the university, we started a campaign to say, are you an adopted child? Most of them now in their 20s and saying, if you're interested in finding your biological parent or relative, uh, we will assist you to do that, completely voluntary. And the interesting, one of the first uh, cases we had was an undergraduate uh, who was, name was Angela uh, Filigram, 
and she had been adopted in Berkeley. Both her parents, her adopted parents were social workers, and they named her after Angela Davis. So, <laughs> well, Angela was a Davis, actually, at UC Davis, as an undergraduate, and she called us at the Human Rights Center, and she said, I was adopted. I, I know my adopted parents would support this. So we went out, and we got a backal swab from her cheek, and sent it down, and we found her mother. So since then, we continue to do this work, uh, working, and, and what's been wonderful about it is geneticists in labs throughout California are dedicating their time, not during the week, but they come in on weekends so that they can do the analysis. And then we've had a number of students who've gone down and worked uh, in, in El Salvador on this project. So again, that's one way of we're taking science and, uh, and applying it in the human rights field. Uh, I guess I'm curious if uh, the effort is that uh, any illumination about what the limiting factor for justice is. So if we say that um, uh, international tribunals move very slowly or that there's like a thing about can't ex extract a war criminal if that person is uh, a US citizen or whatever it is. Um, does, does this effort help to maybe illuminate what the weakest link is for, for getting justice if it doesn't resolve it directly? So to make sure I understand the question correctly, um, the, the last part you were saying that does it help to illuminate where the weakest link is in terms of getting accountability or getting justice and targeting that? Is that? Yeah, I guess it like, uh, you know, that's the old expression they say, you're only as uh, fast as your slowest uh, yeah. part or, you know, only as strong as your weakest link. So what, um, uh, I, I mean, assuming that it's not a lack of desire for justice or a lack of, uh, technical capacity to produce evidence. Is there something that, that you find in this effort that is the limiting factor for justice? Absolutely. So one concrete example, we did a workshop in Kenya. Um, Kim Seelinger, who heads our sexual violence and conflict program, helped to host this workshop where we brought together various groups from Kenya who are looking at the issue of sexual violence that had erupted in the country in the aftermath of their 2007 elections. And the question on the table was how do we, how, how can individuals within that country better deal with the, the psychosocial and health needs of survivors and then also the legal accountability piece of getting justice for sexual violence, which is a very hard crime to get justice for. And so one of the things that was done is within each sector, whether it was education or law enforcement um, or public health, looking at what is the, how do you address the needs of the individual who's had this horrific experience and where is this process falling apart? Kenya had recently revamped its laws to actually be fairly progressive, but yet more cases weren't being brought and weren't being brought successfully. After we did the um, kind of investigation of the links in the chain within each, each, within each sector, we looked at how they're passed between sectors. So for example, if a woman had experienced sexual violence and she went to the medical profession for treatment, what was falling apart between the medical profession and law enforcement and prosecution to actually, and where did we need to shore things up to actually enable this process to work more efficiently? And sometimes it was a particular legal provision. For example, there was one provision in the new Kenyan code that said any woman who brought a claim of sexual violence and failed to successfully prosecute her case would be subject to the same punishment as the man would have received had he been prosecuted. And so one of the things the Kenyan lawyers brought to light was that this law was actually one of the big barriers to actually having women who wanted to come forward for good reason and testify. So it became an effort on the part of the Kenyan lawyers and activists to then go to the attorney general and to advocate to get that law removed and changed. So within each sector, we were finding little bits like this that were the sticking point. 
and then thinking creatively about how do we overcome that, and then between the, the broader spectrum of the individual experience, which touches not only on the legal issues, but the health issues as well, how do we streamline that? So an example of this, of this horizontal piece was that the um, medical field had one form for intake, the police had a different form for intake, and the forms didn't speak to each other. So what you found was law enforcement began talking with public health and saying, let's reconcile our forms so suddenly the data can actually speak to, it, to each other, and that'll make sense. So that was another just very pragmatic outcome of that kind of effort. Um, what are some of the criteria that you use to decide when to go into a country? mainly in the area of like safety uh, for the team and what are some of the things you do to maintain the safety of the team? Because I'm pretty sure in like Guatemala, El Salvador, there's still members of the military and the government who do, do not want to see any of this evidence coming to light and are willing to do whatever to make sure it doesn't. Well, I guess <laughs> the best way to answer that is I, I, learned, I learned the hard way. So. <laughs> So I, uh, I had a forensic team I was working with in, uh, in uh, Croatia and in Vukovar. And even though we were under UN protection, I mean, we had Dutch soldiers with weapons, the Serb forces arrested me and my team uh, because it was g guns down only in defense. So, uh, and then having been expelled from Burma and, and, had that, and persona non grata in Kenya at one point. So I learned, <laughs> how to be a little more careful. And we take, that, we take that very seriously with our students. So we do not allow students to go into dangerous situations. Um, we run before they go out on their fellowships, uh, security uh, training. Uh, one of the key things we tell students that is awfully important, it's not the war that's gonna kill you, it's the driver who's gonna kill you. <laughs> it really is, you have to be careful with the drivers that you hire in these countries. So that's, that's important. But what we try and do in terms of security, we will arrange when we're doing an exhumations, we will always have some kind of police or military protection. Um, and uh, it, with fellows, we, we have had situations where uh, one of them came out to had dengue fever, for example. And uh, she called me from the airport in Bangkok. She'd been working on the border of uh, uh, Burma, and uh, she, she asked um, uh, what I call her mother to tell her she had dengue fever, and I wasn't sure that was in my job description, but I did call her mother. And, um, but we try and, we, we, they all have our cell phones, we're in touch with them, but uh, we really take it very seriously that they, they're well uh, prepared to go into the field. And not only, also prepared to deal with the difficult issues they're, they're going to be uh, dealing with uh, and, and, and prime them on you know, how to take notes, how to take time off, uh, establish friendships. You can talk about what you're witnessing and you're doing. Um, and we've found that they, are, that they often come back very much stronger. And, and, and it's because they've challenged themselves, I think. And they've come back and seen uh, that, that what they're learning at, at Cal, they can actually apply in practical ways. And if I can just piggyback on that, I think another piece of it has been the open source investigations are a way to complement the investigations that happen on the ground, never to replace them. But when you can't, for diplomatic reasons or security reasons, get on the ground in a conflict zone, but the activists who are there currently are trying to get information out, how can we go ahead and, and figure out a way to harness that information that is coming out of that space? And that's why learning how to comb through social media for that information has become you know, somewhat important to help bolster those stories for the people who are there. Of course, that means that the security piece has not only turned to focusing on psychosocial security, like what Eric's talking about, human rights practice is shifting. Human rights practitioners are watching far more video footage and seeing graphic imagery than they ever had previously. And there's something about the experience of being fairly isolated looking at a screen that really changes the nature of the support system you have around you. So we're trying to have students do a lot of their digital work in teams so that they at least have somebody else who can be keeping an eye out for them and helping them know when they need to take a break and need to step down. It also means that some of the security issues have, have shifted to digital security. And so for the human rights cases we're, we're trying to support litigation on, 
Um, thinking through, we actually paused our cases for the first five months of the pilot. We thought we were going to start with those, but we weren't convinced that the digital security and our actual behavioral practices were where they needed to be. Um, in one case, one of the individuals could be killed if his location was revealed. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't inadvertently revealing that location or endangering any of our students who were snooping around the activities of some very powerful people. Um, so I think partnering with some cybersecurity experts has also been the next iteration of thinking through the security space. Um, it sounds like absolutely wonderful students. I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about the uh, backgrounds of the students and then uh, where they ended up, what their careers were after they finished up. Sure, here's one. <laughs> One student uh, got his master's in mechanical engineering, I think, uh, at Northwestern. And I had worked, uh, as was mentioned earlier in the introduction, I, I did a lot of work in Cambodia documenting the social and medical consequences of, of landmines and anti-personnel mines. The problem was we introduced these mines in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, and they're little plastic mines that you can detonate and you leave. And they, li they stay there forever. And so people, civilians step on them. Well, he came to see me and came to uh, Cal. He joined the joint medical program to get his medical degree and also to do a master's in public health. And he worked with me uh, for about three years. And he, uh, he actually ended up developing a prosthetic that can be used in rice fields. Because one of the problems that you have with those who've been injured with landmines is that you need water to flow through the prosthetic. And he designed this prosthetic, and then he took it out to, to, to others uh, to, 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 to have it firms manufacture it. So um, I, 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 here's the story. I had a student come to me once and say, I was raised in Los Angeles. Uh, my family's Armenian. I grew up with my grandparents. Both my grandparents died when they were in the house. Um, this really affected me. I know I'm going to be a physician in about four or five years. And I am really frightened of what's going to happen when I have to deal with the death of my first patient. And I was stunned. And I thought for a minute, and this is why we, we always think empirically, or what can we do? And I said, well, let's. For your master's thesis, why don't we do this? Why don't we set up a study where you will interview physicians who are 30, in that 30 to 40 range, and then you do the 50, 60, and then older physicians to find out what training did they get on how you deal with that, your first step. She went out and interviewed some 40, 50 physicians around the Bay Area, came back, wrote a report, and about three years later, I got a phone call and she dealt with the death of her first patient. But she had gone out and studied and understood, and it, and it gave her the, the courage and the strength to you know, go ahead and do it. So it, it's being able to touch students in that way. Actually, we don't. They come to us, mm -hmm. and we just facilitate what they want, essentially, and, and kind of guide them. Yeah. I think one of the really special parts about this, I mean, the lab, it's been like start, creating a startup, and we're running a full center at the same time. So it's been you know weeks of 18-hour days, 20-hour days. But it's been so exciting and invigorating, and it's because of the students, who they are, and what they're learning about themselves. I think a lot of the students are drawn to different projects because it has meaning to them. So for example, one of our students is Syrian, and he started working on the Syrian archive collection of videos. And for him, what he learned about himself is that because his family politically was so close to Syria, it became too difficult for him to work on that project, and he pivoted to another one. We now have a policy that it's no questions asked, you can move to another project at any time. Another young woman, though, came to me and she said her family had escaped um, you know, tremendous hostility in Iran. And she had always grown up listening to these stories of what her family had gone through, and she felt so helpless and powerless but to finally work on these projects, she feels like she can contribute something and that she has control to a certain degree for the very first time. Um, another student started working on, we have a US project that the students started all on their own. I was actually in Europe at the time, but it was in the aftermath of the most recent election when they were hearing that there was a kind of a rise in hate crimes and hate speech, and they wanted to do something about it. So they thought, what can we do in the lab 
that would contribute to this. And they started a new project line where they were going to gather evidence of hate speech and hate crimes from social media. And we eventually looked around the country to see who else is doing this so we could coordinate efforts. They're now feeding all of their information into a national effort being run by ProPublica and are helping other universities figure out how they can contribute to the space. But one of our students said that she dealt with some of the most graphic videos we had from Syria, from Congo, from Ethiopia, et cetera. But all of a sudden, she was finding the US project to be the hardest. Because for her, as a young Muslim woman on the Berkeley campus, to, to see what people were saying about each other in her own backyard, what, no matter what the population that was being talked about, for her, that hit the hardest. Um, so it's been interesting for us to see how re they react to this, but also for them to learn about who they are and what they might want to work on going forward. A couple of questions. What is the annual budget? How is that funded? How many people are on staff? And how many students do you impact? You know, and how do they pay for their internships over the summer? Great questions. So we have our annual budget is between 1.5 and 1.8 million dollars. We have um, currently 10 full-time staff people, another five to six doctoral students or master students at any given time, and usually one or two undergrads working with us part-time. Um, so usually a staff of somewhere between 17 and 18 people. It is funded, I think it's safe to say, 97% by us. So we, it mostly through private foundations, so the MacArthur Foundation, Open Society Foundations, a couple family foundations in the UK. But it, it, that's the hardest part of our job. It's a constant scramble to come up with that funding. We've gotten individual donations up to about a third of our budget, and quite frankly, I'd love to see that get higher, mostly because it's the money that comes with the fewest strings attached, and so we're actually able to be flexible on the ground. I think the problem with foundation money is you have to project a year or two out what you're going to work on, but our work is designed to be very immediate and very responsive to conflicts as they break out, so we don't always know what we're going to be working on even a month from now. So to have that financial freedom to pivot quickly is important. One of the things we need to do is we're actually trying to start raising money to get a space on the UC Berkeley campus, as I mentioned earlier, because we have one faculty office right now for our students, and it's growing so fast. And one of the things we're probably going to have to do is renovate an older space on campus, not massive renovations, paint and carpet. So I think eventually we're hoping to raise approximately a million dollars so that we can hire a manager for the day-to-day -day efforts of the lab. This would cover us for the next five years for the lab part of our work. Um, but to hire a day-to-day -day manager and to get a space that could be our permanent home so this work that we've been doing for the next 20 years can really kick off for the next 20. And one of the things we try and do is with our individual donors, not all of them, but the, those we can, we try and engage them in the center and, and give you an example. So we give out, we've given out 300 summer fellowships in the last uh, 23 or so years. Um, and I'm on the selection committee and other fac faculty and staff are on from different parts of the university. We usually get about 40, 50, 60 applications and we usually narrow it down to about 15 or so. Well, one of our donors who supports the fellowship program is also on the selection committee. And it was last year we were sitting and we were got down to our final, you know, our finalist. And there were, there were about 12, 13, we were determined that these were, we decided they were gonna get the fellowship. But there were these six others that uh, we also thought were very good. And he couldn't stand it. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and fund those. And right there, he wrote a check. And he, and I mean, and what's so marvelous about it is what we see with these fellowships is those six students, now they got an opportunity and maybe an opportunity that, that launched their career. And he just made that donation like that. It was fabulous. It was, so that, so all of our, all of our, that's to say, as Alexa is saying, we are, we are almost completely uh, uh, private donations. Including salaries and everything. So I mean, the nice part is I do think that the 1.5 we raise every year, I'm really proud of what we've managed to do with it. You asked about how many students we touch. We have approximately 20 fellows from across the UC system, most of them from Berkeley every year. But then the classes that we teach, I, we teach hundred, a couple hundred students every year. 
Um, and then with the lab now, we're expecting about 100 students will be coming through the lab every year and will be trained just on the Berkeley campus. But as we roll this out at other campuses around the world, and as we engage in kind of a train the trainer model, we're expecting that to rep replicate and replicate pretty quickly. We, so in the, with training the forensic teams in Argentina, we called that blueprinting. The same team in Argentina trains a team in Chile, and this is what we hope to do at the lab, is we establish a protocol away, and then, then faculty and other universities can train their students using that. So we kind of multiply, multiplier effect. Does, does Cal give you money? Well, that uh, 5%. Yeah, they, I, we get a little bit of funds towards our teaching for the specific units that we teach, but not for the lab, not for, um, operations. Not for operations, not for the research that we do. That's all. We, we go out there and we raise all that money independently. I, yeah, it's about 3 to 5% that Cal gives us. And the, one, the last question that I think you didn't mm. answer was, how much does it cost for the kid to go on an internship? Mm. And how does that get funded? And then how mm. much... Does the kid get as a fellowship or a fellow? maybe those are the same thing? Yeah, they're the same thing. So a fellowship, we give uh, each student gets five thousand dollar check, and they're given the check. Uh, they have to do a midterm report. They have to come back and uh, either make a video clip or write an op-ed piece, and then they have to present their the findings. So it's five thousand each. But we're it's getting now. We need to push it up a little each year because of the cost of airfare and so on. Mm -hmm. it's about. Yeah. No, it's not. In terms of the investment, though, of Cal, I think what they do invest in this effort is to provide us a space on the campus. And what we've really discovered is that the, the wealth of just knowledge and talent and dedication across that campus is something that we have a luxury to tap into, that if we were not on the campus, we would never have these resources or have this opportunity. So the students are really the investment in the kind of work that we're doing, and that's invaluable. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I compliment you on your good work. Um, I have to tell you something first that will inform my question. 48 years ago, I was trained as a U.S. Army interrogator. And at that time, we were instructed very seriously that we were bound by the Geneva Conventions and that torture was unlawful. And it was told to us, not with a wink and a nod, but told to us seriously. Now, I know that torture goes on. It goes on on the battlefield sometimes. But I've always been sensitive about this. And my question is, uh, you know, given how, you, how your programs are funded, does the fact that John Yu is a colleague through the law school cause you any difficulties or any of your donors, or any of your donors difficult? Do you want any of them? Really, and, and honestly, in a word for us, no. Um, and uh, John Yu is, uh, would, would I fair to say, he's the other end of the spectrum from where we are. Uh, to the extent that uh, we conducted, uh, just to show you how we're bipartisan. We, we do empirical work. We did a study. We were asked by the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York back in 2006 to do a study of former Guantanamo detainees. So we traveled to nine different countries, and we interviewed 62 former Guantanamo detainees. We wrote a report. We decided to wait till after the election in 2008, so it didn't look like we were you know, influenced. Not that maybe we would, but... And we released it, and we called for a, a blue ribbon commission to investigate torture and whatever. Also, this year, we've been working to, so, so we've looked at that issue, and, and actually, Alexa, her, her, her dissertation was on, on torture, and, and a lot of that was looking at uh, John Yu's uh, torture memos. But the other thing we've done this year is we've just been down uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, studying the, uh, the Sheriff's Department's Human, uh, Human Trafficking Bureau. So we don't care. We'll go, into, we look, we'll go into law enforcement. We'll take our students. We'll go in and we'll question. We'll, and they've asked us to come and evaluate this bureau that they've established with investigators and service providers and so on. So we go across the spectrum. 
because we believe what we can instill into the students is this respect for rigor, for fact, for checking facts, uh, and, and, and listening, being able to pull back and listen and, uh, and um, talk you know, after you've done your research. So, so we're very, we've stood out, and we, Alex and I are about to publish, if anyone would like a copy. Uh, we've taken the torture memos, as they're called, and we've deconstructed them, and we're publishing it in a book uh, about how they were really misleading uh, and uh, was, was really uh, the, you know, a bad lawyering, essentially. Well, uh, again, thank you for your good work. All right, I think we have time for one final question. Right here. Hi. Um, so as somebody who isn't currently a student but is you know, looking at the possibility but may not go back to school, what, what options do non-students have for helping or being part of your organization? Hmm. That's a really great question. So there are various opportunities that pop up all the time. I think for anyone who wants to be engaged, one of the, the first things you could do, we have our annual reports out front, and it says how to get on our newsletter. We send a newsletter about once a month with opportunities to engage. And it might be everything from, we just ran a series this year on gun violence, bringing together people from very, who have very different perspectives, who have done um, interesting research on the topic, to talk and debate and, ha and kind of figure out what needs to happen next in the space. We did one last year on um, detention facilities, prisons, policing. Um, so, so in getting engaged with those series, I think certainly, you know, depending on what your interests and talents are, we're always writing reports, potentially reviewing those. Um, we've had people who have volunteered for some of our different program lines on sexual violence and immigration, and we have one that's coming on health and human rights. Um, so yes, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you further about that. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. I, uh, you know, they script me, and they, I'm supposed to say, um, we hope you enjoyed this, but I'm not sure enjoyment's the right word for tonight. Uh, it was very enlightening. Um, and, and, I, and I always tell people it's, you know, it's up to us as you know, the alumni and the family of the campus in terms of what we can do to help you know, you know, people like the two of you in terms of what you're doing. Um, it, this was an incredible program and I thank both of you for coming tonight. Um, uh, you know, please stay if you have questions. Um, it, was, it, was, it was great and good night and go Bears. <laughs>